Section 3 Ages to Come Hebrews Revelation Introduction There is one verse in the Bible that instructs believers on how to study God's Word. That verse is found in Paul's final epistle that he writes just before he is martyred in Rome. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When studying any portion of the Bible, it is imperative for believers to always ask whom the book is written to in order to fully understand its context. Dispensations in the Bible Paul mentions the word dispensation on four separate occasions. Sadly, these verses are not found in the modern translations of the Bible. The word dispensation is found in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, Ephesians 1 verse 10, Ephesians 3 verse 2, and finally, Colossians 1 verse 25. Ephesians 3 verse 2, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you ward. The very fact that the dispensation of the grace of God was given to Paul, implies that there was a dispensation that preceded it. That dispensation was the law, which was given to the children of Israel to follow. Galatians 4 verses 4 to 5, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Theologians have listed numerous dispensations that they see in Scripture, but the Apostle Paul teaches us about the three main dispensations in the Bible in his epistle to the Ephesians, and he gives them all titles. Those titles are, in times past, Ephesians 2 verse 3, but now, Ephesians 2 verse 13 ages to come, Ephesians 2 verse 7. It is this third dispensation, ages to come, that we will concern ourselves with now. The two previous dispensations that Paul mentions are dealt with in sections 1 and 2 of the Dispensational Study Bible. The Epistle of Hebrews Introduction The book of Hebrews was written sometime soon after Pentecost and before Saul of Tarsus got saved in Acts chapter 9. It is very clear that the message in Hebrews is harmonious with the doctrines being taught by the twelve apostles in Acts chapters 1 to 8. Hebrews was written during the extra year given by God to Israel to produce fruit of righteousness after the cross in Luke 13 verses 6 to 9. That year ended at the stoning of Stephen in Acts 8. It was at Stephen's death at the hands of Israel's leaders that Stephen says something very unique to them. Acts 7 verse 56, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man, standing on the right hand of God. The reason this statement is unique is because of something Isaiah said concerning the nation of Israel about the two reasons that God stands up for them. Isaiah 3 verse 13, The Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people. The time for God's pleading with Israel had ended, so Jesus stood up to judge them on that day, and those religious leaders all took offense at what Stephen was implying concerning them. They rejected the message of a man filled with the Holy Spirit who was giving the nation one more chance to repent and to produce fruits of righteousness, and instead they killed him. When Israel's extra year to repent had come to an end, God postponed the wrath that he had promised to Israel so that he could save Saul of Tarsus. He would take the gospel of the grace of God to the whole world in spite of Israel's rejection. Jeremiah 30 verse 7, Acts 9 and 20 28. The book of Hebrews is written to Hebrews. It is not written to the new man where there is no Jew nor Greek. Colossians 3 verses 10 to 11, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all, and in all. With the book's proper context established, we can now begin to understand the message in this great book. The book of Hebrews is a transitional book that explains the changes between the Old and the New Covenants. The Gospels were the milk needed by new believers, while Hebrews through Revelation was the meat that these Hebrew believers needed to eventually move on to. The church, which is Christ's body, is to fellowship in the mysteries that were dispensed to the Apostle Paul by the risen Christ. Ephesians 3 verse 2 We are not a nation of priests, nor are we a covenant people. Israel is. Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6 To claim we are spiritual Jews, or the Israel of God, is to believe in replacement theology which is very anti-Semitic. 1 Peter 2 verses 3 to 9 is not written to you and me today in the church. It is written to the Jewish remnant of believers that were scattered abroad. Peter was a part of that holy nation, not you. You are a part of the body of Christ. Every promise given to Israel under the old covenant belongs to Israel, not the church. We have spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The prophet Jeremiah tells Israel, who was still under the old covenant, that a new covenant was coming to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, 
and this covenant will be eventually written on their hearts during their kingdom. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. These verses have absolutely nothing to do with the church, which is Christ's body, they are written to the house of Israel, and to the house of Judah. Did God ever bring the body of Christ out of Egypt? No. Did he ever establish the law with the body of Christ at M.T. Sinai? No. We were never under the covenant that he made with the children of Israel. God was married to Israel, a husband unto them, and they broke the covenant that God made with them. After the time of Jacob's trouble, God will put his laws in Israel's inward parts, and he will write it in their hearts, not ours. Israel will have no need of a teacher to teach them the word of God, because they will all know it. They will teach it to the Gentile world during that kingdom age dispensation. This is not happening today. The authorship of Hebrews. Who is the author of the book of Hebrews? No one knows. Luke is the best possible guess as he was Paul's traveling companion and understood Israel's program as well as the church's mystery program. Luke knew Timothy very well because they ministered together along with the apostle Paul. Luke learned what he knew about Jesus from the apostles. As we study this book, we will not find out who wrote Hebrews, but we can disqualify a lot of people by some of the things that the actual unnamed writer says in his writings. Paul could not have written the book of Hebrews according to Hebrews 2 verse 3, because the author says he heard the gospel from those that heard from Christ personally, the apostles. Paul said that God told him his gospel, and that he did not receive it from any man. Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2 verses 3 to 4, How shall we escape, if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will? Chapter 1 Better than the angels. Hebrews 1 verse 1 God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Sundry times, God spoke to Moses out of the midst of a burning bush, and another time he spoke to a prophet through a donkey. Divers manners, he would speak to the prophets through the use of dreams or visions. God even spoke to man through the use of angels at different times. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, to speak unto Israel. Galatians 4 verse 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. In time past, this is a reference to God speaking to Israel's fathers by the prophets before the time of Jesus beginning his public ministry. This would include the time of John the Baptist, who also was a prophet which spoke to Israel. Luke 7 verse 28, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Hebrews 1 verse 2 hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. In these last days, the last days in Israel's prophecy program began with the day of Pentecost, and the fulfilling of Joel 2 verses 28 to 32. Joel tells his readers that when those things begin to happen, it will be the last days of Israel's prophecy program leading up to the time of God's wrath being poured out. Acts 2 verse 17 And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. There are three divisions of time in the Bible, in times past, but now, and ages to come. We live in the but now, dispensation, aka the dispensation of grace. The in times past dispensation was before the dispensation of grace, and the ages to come is after this dispensation of grace is over. The dispensation of grace ends with the rapture of the body of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 17, spoken unto us by his Son, Israel is the us in Hebrews 1 verse 2. Since the world began, God has spoken to the fathers of the nation of Israel by the prophets, 
that is what we will refer to as Israel's prophecy program. Just before the prophecy program was put on hold, God sent his only son to speak to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10 verses 1 to 5. Notice the phrase in these last days is used in the above verse. The last days are the last days of Israel's prophecy program, when the Messiah would come and be rejected. The writer of Hebrews believed as did his Hebrew hearers that they were prophetically in Israel's last days, because they were. Their last days, however, were put on hold so that God could usher in the unprophesied dispensation of grace, which we are experiencing still today. This dispensation will end with the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. Ephesians 3 verse 2, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you ward. Israel was in the last days of her prophecy program until God set her aside in partial blindness because of unbelief to usher in the body of Christ. Romans 11 verse 25, The last days for Israel will pick back up again when the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble begins and they will end when Israel enters into her rest during the kingdom. We, in the body of Christ are living in the dispensation of grace, also known as the but now time period. Ephesians 2 verses 7 to 13, that in the ages to come he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember, that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The book of Ephesians shows us God's way of rightly dividing time according to his plan. Those times are, in time past, but now, and ages to come. Ephesians 2 verse 2 13. Peter said that Israel was in the last days of their prophecy program in Acts 2 and 3. The but now period did not start until the body of Christ began with the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who was given the dispensation of grace to give unto us today in the body of Christ. Ephesians 3 verse 2. Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 6. For this cause I Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you ward, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. We are not in the last days of Israel's prophecy program today. We are a parenthetical people in the church's mystery program that was unprophesied in the Old Testament. Our mystery program also has its own last days, which will end with our rapture. The last days for Israel program will then resume as the tribulation period begins, and it lasts for seven years. Whom he hath appointed the heir of all things, Jesus Christ is the heir of all things, in both heavenly places and on the earth. Believing Israel will be the heir of all things earthly. The church, which is his body, is to be the heir of all things heavenly. Ephesians 1 verse 3, by whom also he made the worlds. Verse 2 tells us that when God made the worlds by his son, that he was God's son when he made the worlds. He didn't become his son at his birth, or at his baptism, or even at his resurrection when he was begotten from the dead. Spoken unto us by his son, the U.S. is Israel in this verse. The son spoke unto Israel, and they killed him. Matthew 21 verses 33 to 46. Hebrews 1 verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The brightness of his glory, John 1 verse 14, and the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The express image of his person, this simply means that what God wants to communicate or express to Israel was perfectly exhibited in his Son when he appeared unto them. Jesus is the express image of God. When Israel saw Jesus, they saw the Father. When they saw Jesus, they saw Emmanuel, God with us. John 14 verse 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, shew us the Father? Just as the Jew in the first century needed answers from the apostles about who Christ was, 
They are going to need them in the tribulation period to explain why they should trust Jesus at that time. Those tribulation saints will want to know that if the Jesus described in the New Testament is the Christ, and if so, then why is he allowing the suffering they are going through during the tribulation period? It is because he must wait for his enemies to be made his footstool, as verse 3 says, which is a quote from Psalm 110 verse 1. This psalm is the most repeated verse in all the Bible. It explains Christ's delay in establishing his kingdom. He had by himself purged our sins. Sins were never forgiven by a man's works in any age. Christ purged Israel's sins by himself. Hebrews 1 verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Being made so much better than the angels, God has always existed as a triune being. But the man Jesus, was made man when he was conceived in the womb of Mary by the Spirit of God. His divinity did not begin on that day, it had always existed. No angel was in any way like him. Angels are created beings, they were not born. They did not exist in eternity past. He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. The Son obtained a more excellent name than any of the angels at his resurrection, when he inherited that name because of his faithfulness to his heavenly Father in his earthly ministry. Until the cross, Jesus was just another name that many others in Israel had. After he had purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, with a name that was exalted above every name. Hebrews 1 verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Psalm 2 verse 7, I will declare the decree, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. 2 Samuel 7 verse 14, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. The answer to all of these questions is that he has never said any of those things to any of the angels. When God became a man, he took upon himself, not the nature of angels, but of man. As the God-man Jesus Christ, God the Father instructs the angels of God to worship God the Son in human form at his birth in Bethlehem as they sang at his arrival. When we see in verse 5 that God had begotten him, he is referring to him being the firstborn from the dead. Colossians 1 verse 18, he was the first to have a glorified resurrected body that will never taste of death again. Hebrews 1 verse 6, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Psalm 97 verse 7, confounded be all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols, worship him, all ye gods. No angels were allowed to receive worship, because God alone was worthy to be worshipped. Since God commanded angels to worship Jesus, then God was stating that the man that they were worshipping was fully God, and fully man. Hebrews 1 verse 7, And of the angels he saith, who mocketh his angels' spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. Psalm 104 verse 4, Who mocketh his angels' spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Hebrews 1 verses 8 to 9, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness, and hated iniquity, Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Psalm 45 verses 6 to 7, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness, and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Here we have God the Father, calling God the Son, God, twice, in two consecutive verses. God never has called an angel God. Hebrews 1 verses 10 to 12 And, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands, they shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Psalm 102 verses 25 to 27 Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yeah, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. In Psalm 102, we have a discussion between God the Son and God the Father, in which the Son asks the Father not to shorten his days. The Father responds by saying words of comfort to his Son as he was dying on the cross. He would not leave his soul in hell but he would raise him up. Why couldn't the grave keep Christ? Since Christ was not born a sinner, and he never sinned, he did not deserve to die, because death had no claim over him, and he was able to leave whenever he finished what he was doing there. The earth and heavens will get folded up and put away one day, 
and he will make a new heaven and a new earth. No angel could ever have this said about them. Hebrews 1 verse 13, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Psalm 110 verse 1 A Psalm of David The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Hebrews 1 verse 14 Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them, who shall be heirs of salvation? Until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Verse 13 is a reference to Christ being told by the Father after his rejection by his own people to wait patiently by his side, in exile. Then he pours out his wrath upon a world who has rejected his son. Then he may go and establish his throne on the earth. His enemies are the religious in Israel. Are they not all ministering spirits? These are angels. Them who shall be heirs of salvation. The writer of Hebrews says here that Israel shall be heirs of salvation. We in the body of Christ today are already joined heirs with Christ in heavenly places. Hebrews 6 verse 17 wherein God, willing more abundantly to shew unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Hebrews 11 verse 9, By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. 1 Peter 1 verses 5 to 10, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. James 2 verse 5 Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Israel will receive salvation in the future, at the day of atonement, at the onset of the millennial kingdom. Angels were in time past ministering spirits to Israel. They will be again in ages to come as well. Chapter 2 The Reason for His Incarnation Hebrews 2 verse 1 Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. The things which we have heard, this is a reference to things in chapter 1 that they should have given the more earnest heed to the gospel of the kingdom. Hebrews 2 verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. The word spoken by angels, this is a reference to the law and the prophets, which the scriptures record that Israel received from angels. In Acts 7 verse 28, Stephen tells Israel's leaders that Moses received the lively oracles from an angel at Mount Sinai. To violate the law in many instances was to suffer the penalty of death. Hebrews 2 verse 3, How shall we escape, if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? How shall we escape, if we neglect? The we spoken about here are those that heard the apostles speak to them. If the word spoken by angels was broken back under Moses, and the people were punished, how much more when it is the word spoken by God the Son, while he was in their midst. So great salvation, the salvation that the writer speaks about as being spoken of first by Christ is in reference to the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4 verses 17 to 23, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, it was then preached by the twelve apostles to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The apostles confirmed that message unto the author of Hebrews, and to the us, those who believed in Israel made up the little flock mentioned in Luke 12 verse 32, who would inherit the kingdom. Paul could not be the writer of the book of Hebrews, because he did not receive his message from them that heard Christ, the apostles. He heard it from the risen Christ personally. Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2 verses 4 to 5, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. God also bearing them witness, the writer proclaims that those that heard Jesus, the twelve, bore witness by giving them signs and wonders, divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. The writer himself does not claim any of these gifts for himself, 
but solely leaves it as the twelve apostles alone who were able to perform them. This excludes Paul from being the author of Hebrews, because he had signs and wonders associated with his ministry. This eliminates all of the twelve from being the writer of Hebrews as well. So, the field narrows as to who the writer really is. The world to come, verse 5 also gives us a clue as to the world to come, which is a reference to the millennial kingdom. In the kingdom, the twelve apostles will sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and the world to come will be in subjection to them. 2 Peter 3 verse 13 Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Hebrews 2 verses 6 to 7 But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man, that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownst him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Psalm 8 verses 4 to 6, What is man, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, thou hast put all things under his feet. Christ was made a little lower than the angels, so that he could taste death for all men. He was not lower in rank, because he has always been God. But through the Incarnation, he humbled himself and became the Godman. In his humanity, he was a little lower than the angels, as we are today. Death can hold us, but it could not hold him because he was not guilty of sin. By his worthiness, we can be made righteous. Hebrews 2 verse 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Psalm 8 verse 6, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. The author of Hebrews quotes David the psalmist in the 8th Psalm here to back up what he is saying about Jesus and his place above the angels so as to show his Hebrew readers that Jesus is the Christ. He knows that these readers will say and ask that since all things were not put under him right then, why should they believe in him? After the 1,000-year kingdom has ended, and Satan has been cast into the lake of fire, Christ will then have all things in heaven, earth, and under the earth put under him. Hebrews 2 verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Psalm 8 verses 4 to 6, What is man, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Made a little lower than the angels, the writer explains that Jesus had to be made a man, and that he did not take on the form of an angel, so that he could taste death for every man. For the suffering of death, he is saying to his readers that Christ had to become a man and die for them. Crowned with glory and honor, he now waits for the end of the time of Jacob's trouble to return out of exile to destroy his enemies and to set up his kingdom. Psalm 8 verse 5. Taste death for every man. Revelation 5 verses 5 to 9. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and, lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps, and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. Hebrews 2 verse 10, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For it became him, it was suited for him. In bringing many sons unto glory, those who believed in him as the Christ, would receive glorified resurrected bodies. The captain of their salvation, the word captain means someone who keeps those below them safe, by leading them safely through the battle. Perfect through sufferings, the word perfect here means to make complete, or to finish a product. Christ perfectly completed all things necessary for Israel's salvation and ours in the body of Christ. Psalm 138 verse 8, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Luke 13 verse 32, And he said unto them, Go ye, and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, 
and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. If he would have done only the things which he did leading up to the cross, it would not have been enough to purchase our salvation. He had to suffer, the just, for the unjust. Hebrews 2 verses 11 to 13, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee, and again, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold I, and the children which God hath given me. Matthew 28 verse 10, Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Psalm 22 verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Psalm 18 verse 2, The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. Isaiah 8 verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Here numerous Old Testament scriptures are quoted backing up the fact that God identifies himself with the children of Israel and calls them his brethren because they have been set apart by him the only one who can sanctify anyone. It says that he would sing praise unto his father in the midst of the church, assembly, or congregation. He did this in Matthew 26 verse 30, before they headed out to the Mount of Olives. Why does he mention Israel over and over again as his brethren? Because he is their kinsman redeemer. In order to be a kinsman redeemer, you first have to be a kinsman, that is why Jesus had to be a descendant of Abraham to be able to redeem his brethren. The problem is that no one that is solely human, and a fellow Jew could ever redeem anyone, because they were all guilty of sin by their earthly father Adam. Israel's kinsman redeemer was virgin born, thus bypassing inheriting mankind's sinful nature, and he never sinned by choice either. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He was a kinsman, who was willing and able, to serve the role as the Redeemer. Hebrews 2 verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. 1 John 4 verses 2 to 3 Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. 2 John 1 verse 7 For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. The power of death, Satan had the power of death, and of hell. Satan can take a life, but God has the power to destroy him and his influence, and he will do just that one day. In order for Christ to wield this power, he would have to become a man and do what man could not do, which was live a sinless life and suffer as mankind's substitute. Through his death, he received the power to destroy the works of the devil. The main work of the devil was bringing about death upon mankind. Hebrews 2 verses 15 to 16, And deliver them who through fear of death, were all their lifetime, subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him, the seed of Abraham. Subject to bondage, Israel all their life was subject to wages of sin, which was death, because of Adam's sin and their own sin. They were under the law of Moses, and were in bondage to it, until what the law pictured showed up, which was Christ. He was the fulfillment of the law. The nature of angels, Jesus was not an angel, a spirit being. He had flesh and blood, just as a man, because he was fully man, and fully God. The seed of Abraham, notice it doesn't say he took on him the nature of man, but the seed of Abraham. He had to be born of Abraham's lineage because it will be through the nation of Israel that God will set up his earthly kingdom and place all things therein under his authority. Hebrews 2 verse 17 Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, made like unto his brethren, who were his brethren, Israel, a merciful and faithful high priest, a priest is a minister between God and men, which we shall look at later. The Apostle Paul tells us just who it was that Jesus Christ came to minister to when he came in the flesh in his epistle to the Romans. Romans 15 verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. To Israel, Jesus ultimately ministered as their merciful and faithful high priest. He willingly offered himself as their sacrifice and asked his father to forgive, to shew mercy, 
to his crucifiers. Jesus is the head of the church, which is his body. He is not our king, nor is he our high priest. He is Israel's king and high priest. A nation has a king. The body of Christ is not a nation and has never had a high priest for that same reason. Israel and the body of Christ are two different things associated with two different programs. In order for a priest to begin his ministry, he had to wait until he was 30 years of age. In Numbers chapter 4, this requirement is mentioned eight times. Eight is the number of new beginnings, so you will remember it. Luke 3 verse 23, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Jesus was washed with water and anointed at his baptism, and both of these two rituals were a requirement for a priest before they could begin their ministry. Exodus 29 verses 4 to 7, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with water. And thou shalt take the garments, and put upon Aaron the coat, and the robe of the ephod, and the ephod, and the breastplate, and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head, and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil, and pour it upon his head, and anoint him. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people, a mediator had to make reconciliation for his people. Israel was Jesus' brethren. John 1 verse 11, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Hebrews 2 verse 18, For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. He is able to succor them that are tempted. He is able to help them that are tempted. Christ was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He can relate to mankind having become a man. His temptation in the wilderness was more than the three short temptings of the devil that we remember. They were preceded by 40 days of fasting. Chapter 3 Partakers of Christ Hebrews 3 verses 1 to 2 Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the Apostle and High Priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Holy Brethren, the writer now calls the recipients of this epistle to the Hebrews, Holy Brethren. This lets us know that he is speaking about the believing remnant during those days, and not the generation of vipers that existed at the same time, made up of all the religious leaders that wanted to kill the Christ. Matthew 23 verse 33, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Partakers of the heavenly calling. The heavenly calling does not mean that they are called to heaven, but rather that their calling to be holy comes from heaven. This calling came at Mount Sinai when God called them to be a holy nation. Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. The writer then says that because I have showed you that Jesus is the Son of God, and the Son of Man in chapters 1 and 2, you now need to consider that he is also your apostle and high priest. It is God the Father that appointed Jesus Christ to be Israel's high priest. The apostle and high priest of our profession, this tells you that the author of the book of Hebrews considers himself to be a part of that holy calling, a part of the kingdom of priests as Peter did in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. Notice that Jesus was the high priest of our, meaning, Israel's profession. The writer includes himself with his audience. Israel was promised that if they would be obedient to the covenant given at Mount Sinai, that they would become a kingdom of priests. They were not faithful, so they only became a tribe of priests, Levi. In the kingdom, this promise will be totally fulfilled. Exodus 32. Under the new covenant, he will give them the ability to keep it by writing its words on their hearts instead of on tablets of stone. Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house, Jesus, the man, was faithful in all that the Father sent him to do. John 17 verses 1 to 4 These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. The house is spoken of here is the house of Israel. Remember that Jesus ministered to the circumcision to confirm Israel's promises that God made unto them. Romans 15 verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Hebrews 3 verses 3 to 4, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, 
inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. This speaks to his humanity. Jesus was fully God, and fully man. He who hath builded the house, the house of Israel. Moses was a part of that house, but it was Jesus Christ that created man and who built the house of Israel, thus qualifying him as the greater of the two. Hebrews 3 verses 5 to 6, And Moses verily was faithful in all his house, as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. The writer of this epistle compares Moses as a servant in someone else's house with Jesus as the son of the owner of that very same house. Whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? The writer then lumps himself in with this group and warns them that they were in danger of being removed from God's house if they did not hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. The end spoken of here is the end of the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30 verse 7. We are not a part in any way of the house of Israel. If they give into the world during the tribulation period and they take Satan's mark, there is no chance for them. They will be cast out into outer darkness. This is one of the passages people will go to teach that a person can lose their salvation today in the dispensation of grace. It is not talking to us. If someone in the tribulation period does not endure unto the end, even though they believed in Jesus, he will say to them, I never knew you. This is not doctrine for the body of Christ, but a tribulation teaching for Israel. Hebrews is written for Israel, to help them understand what God is doing with the nation of Israel in that time. The Provocation Hebrews 3 verses 7 to 11 Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So, I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Numbers 13 to 14 and Psalm 95 verse 10. The provocation, it is also called the day of temptation in the wilderness. Israel is being told to hear God's voice again during the time of tribulation and to not make the same mistakes their ancestors made when they were wandering in the wilderness. They were refused entry into the promised land. These hearers will be forbidden from entering into the kingdom because of their hardness of heart and their love for the temporary benefits that the mark of the beast may provide them. Hebrews 3 verses 12 to 13, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. While it is called today, while there is still time, the deceitfulness of sin will break some as they suffer in the wilderness, and many will turn their back on the messages that they have heard from the two witnesses and the 144,000. Hebrews 3 verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, the recipients of this epistle are made partakers of Christ if they hold the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end of the tribulation period. This is not Paul teaching the body of Christ anything. This is written by a Jewish disciple of the twelve apostles to the nation of Israel who is telling the Jews that are following the kingdom program that they need to hold on to the end. Unto the end, those that hold the beginning of their confidence, belief in Christ, steadfast unto the end of the tribulation period, example, those that endure unto the end, they will be made partakers of Christ in the kingdom. Matthew 24 verse 13. This is written to the Hebrews that will be going through the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30 verse 7. Hebrews 3 verses 15 to 19, while it is said, Today if ye will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he, that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So, we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. How many people believed God in that day? Two, Joshua and Caleb, but the rest provoked God to punish them. The writer here compels his hearers in the first century and in the tribulation period to be like Joshua and Caleb. They will need to believe the good report they have heard from God through the books of Hebrews through Revelation, that if they do things his way, he will get them through. If, however, they listen to the majority in Israel, they will fall short and not enter into the kingdom of God that is eternal. The offer of the kingdom in Acts 3 verses 19 to 21 was rejected after just one year, 
so the writer doesn't want any of his hearers to miss out on this last offer of it. Luke 13 verses 6 to 9, He spake also this parable, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it, and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Matthew 24 verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Phillips, Jim, The Dispensational Study Bible.